Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Avi, and I help run events here at the Strand. Before we launch into the discussion of Larry Krasner's new book, For the People, A Story of Justice and Power, I'd like to share a little bit of history about the Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Searching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, the Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Whiting. We want to thank all of you for your support. With our loyal community of book lovers and authors, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we're thrilled to have with us Larry Krasner for a discussion of his newest book, For the People. Larry Krasner is currently serving as the 26th District Attorney of Philadelphia. Krasner worked as a criminal defense lawyer in Philadelphia for 30 years before being elected District Attorney in 2017. Joining Larry in conversation tonight is John Legend. John Legend is an EGOT winning, critically acclaimed, multi platinum singer songwriter. He has garnered 12 Grammy Awards and an Academy Award, a Golden Globe Award, a Tony Award, and an Emmy Award, among others. Legend is the first African American man to earn an EGOT and one of only 15 in the prestigious EGOT Club. Legend has released seven celebrated albums over the course of his career. Beyond his music career, John is a principal along with partners Mike Jackson and Ty, and, and Ty Sticlorius of Get Lifted Film Co. Get Lifted has developed television projects with major networks, including ABC, NBC, Fox, HBO, Showtime, Netflix, and MTV. Recently announced, Get Lifted and Eric Feig's Picture Start formed Picture Lift, a joint venture focused on developing, producing, financing multiple films featuring diverse filmmakers and inclusive cast. As a philanthropist, Legend initiated the hashtag Free America campaign in 2015 to change the national conversation surrounding our country's misguided criminal justice policies and to end mass incarceration. In addition to Legend's signature initiatives, he serves on the board of directors of Harlem Village Academies and Management Leadership for Tomorrow and at the advisory board for the Quattrum Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School and Teach for All. So without further ado, Please welcome Larry Krasner and John Legend to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm John, and uh, I'm excited to be here with my friend, Larry Krasner. Welcome, Larry. Well, welcome to you, too. It's great to see you, John. My pleasure. Uh, let's talk about your book a bit. Uh, For the People, it's been described as optimistic. It's been described as hopeful and uh, inspiring, telling true stories about criminal justice and the need for criminal justice reform. Um, but uh, this is not uh, a textbook. Uh, it's not an academic work. This is a, a book of stories that are true, that were gathered by you, the author, from your 30-year career of defending people accused of crimes in criminal court and pushing against police abuse and civil rights matters. This is storytelling about your career and, and the campaign that came before you actually were elected um, to be district attorney in Philadelphia in 2017. Now, um, Larry knows that uh, he and I worked together to help him get elected and to get reelected um, in Philadelphia. But uh, this story is not about his tenure in office, um, which you could see uh, some, uh, some great work around that. Uh, if you watch the uh, PBS Independent Lens eight-part docu-series called Philly DA, which tells the story of his first few years in office. Uh, but this book, For the People, tells what came before all that, what inspired him to run, uh, the campaign itself, the career and the life that came before um, that prepared him to be the district attorney of Philadelphia. So we're going to talk about that book, For the People, with district attorney Larry Krasner. Welcome, Larry. Well, thank you for having me. You know, John, a lot of these stories are really just the stories that I would tell back in, in my law office after I came back from court. I was in court usually five days a week. Yeah. And you come back a little bit exhausted, exhilarated, and you tell these stories, or they were stories I would tell my kids at the dinner table that night, because, you know, there, there is a fascination that a lot of us have, certainly I have, with what happens in a courtroom. But it, it also ended up being stories about the politics of the campaign. And to me, at a moment when there's such an attack on democracy, stories about how someone who's a complete outsider is able to win, um, you know, I think is useful. The, the book even includes some lists of how it is. If you're a complete insider, you can beat the mainstream centrist yeah. party, the people who seem so powerful. They're not that powerful. 
Yeah, well, the book is titled For the People. And uh, as um, anyone who was watching the, the presidential campaign last year uh, knows, uh, our uh, vice president, who was formerly a district attorney and an attorney general, talked about that phrase uh, for the people. Um, what does it mean to you and, and why did you entitle your book For the People? So there's a moment at the beginning of any kind of court proceeding in criminal court where the defense attorney will stand up and say, you know, my name is Frank Jones. I'm here for defendant Billy Smith. But there's also a moment when the prosecutor stands up. The prosecutor does not give the name of the victim or yeah. the name of the survivor. The prosecutor says, I'm here for the people. And that's an important distinction because the prosecutor's oath is to seek justice for everyone. Everyone is a big term. Everyone means you're there to seek it for the victim, for the survivor, but you're also there to make sure the process is fair for the accused, Billy Smith. And it also means that you have to make sure that the whole system is fair to everyone who's outside of the courtroom, including that 10 year old girl who doesn't have enough money uh, in her public schools somewhere in North Philadelphia, but really needs it. And that to me is a very important distinction. Many traditional prosecutors thought that this was all about being oppositional. It was all about an adversarial proceeding where they represented the victim exclusively. No, it isn't. And that's not my opinion. That's the law. Yeah, for the people, you're there to represent the interests of the entire community and make sure the entire community stays safe and that the resources of the community are being uh, um, uh, uh, used in the right way uh, to, to make sure we all are healthier, safer, and, and all edified by the work that you do. So let's think about the role of the prosecutor and how different it is from what you were doing prior to running for um, DA and, and what made you decide now's the time after all this experience defending clients, um, now's the time for me to actually join the other side? Well, you know, I, I sometimes say that it was like 30 years of a slow motion car crash. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually you've just had enough. You know, I decided to run for the first time in my life at 56 years of age, 30 years into my career. And I did that simply because I had gotten a lot of justice for individuals in my career. I fought really hard. But getting justice for individuals doesn't mean a whole lot when you're just a drop in a bucket and the bucket is injustice. What was happening the entire time I was making sure a few people got fair treatment is that we were seeing a rise in mass incarceration. We became the most incarcerated country in the world. Our approach to sentencing became absurd. You know, I literally saw at the time I decided to run for DA four sale signs that were posted on the walls of public schools all over Philadelphia as the city sold off one building after another and the class sizes got even worse in a, in a city where we got a lot of great teachers, but we don't have a lot of great educational results. Um, so, you know, at a certain point, it was inescapable that what was happening here is we were burning up all of the resources that could be used so effectively for prevention and we were using them for retribution. We were using them for punishment. It's a system that frankly, I don't think it makes any sense. You know, you look at other countries and you see they have much lower rates of incarceration and much lower rates of crime. There has to be a better way to do this. And I just felt that 56 years of age, like I had not brought about any kind of sweeping change. I had not had an impact that was truly significant. And I thought at a minimum, I should raise my voice. So talk about what the role of the district attorney is for those who don't understand the power and the, and the discretion um, that district attorneys hold in their communities. Um, why is it uh, such a pivotal role? So a uh, district attorney is one kind of chief prosecutor. Sometimes they're called state's attorneys, like, you know, one of my sheroes, Kim Fox in Chicago. Um, yes, with her but, too. But they are, yes, she's, she's a great one. But anyway, uh, the, the role has tremendous discretion. Basically, you are in a position to, to on your own, decide, will I seek the death penalty or not? Will I seek a high sentence or not? Will I prosecute this case at all? Or yeah. do I believe this was self-defense? Do I believe there's insufficient reliable evidence to even bring a case? Do I want to prosecute people who possess marijuana at all? I decided no. Do I want to prosecute sex workers at all? I decided no. You know, that is the kind of power that in many ways you do not see in a U.S. Senator a member of the House, you don't even see it to some extent in a president because it is executive power that is final and is not subject to appeal. 
in almost every situation. So it's a tremendous amount of power that affects a lot of people's lives and not just the ones who get locked up and not just the ones in court and not just the victims. It affects the lives of the 10 year old girl who could cure cancer, but doesn't get a shot because she didn't get the education she needed in some North Philly public school. And I say that as a public school graduate myself. So I feel strongly about that. But it, there's a tremendous amount of power there. And for so long, it has been used by people who simply slammed on the gas of putting more and more people in jail, seeking the death penalty all the time, trying to get the highest possible conviction for the largest number of years. We need to slam on the brake. And that's what we have been able to do in Philly. But this book is actually the story of how I got to the point where, I, you know, where I really wanted to do that. And the experiences, the lives of people I saw and how they brought me to that point. Talk about what it feels like to run for office for the first time uh, late in your career after you've had uh, quite a career uh, leading up to that moment. It's a very different thing to put yourself before the people and, and ask for them to put their faith in you and put their vote uh, behind you. Um, what does it feel like to go from someone whose job was to convince a courtroom, convince a jury, to trying to convince a whole city? You know, to some extent, it's all the same job. It's all yeah. communication. Communication with a jury for many, many, many years means that you have, a, you have a certain ability to read people. You understand how to communicate with your peers. Every juror in Philadelphia is a Philadelphian. Yeah. The, voter, the voters are all Philadelphians. And when you jury, you don't just come out of a hat. You should talk to them. And so you find out things like, it is very, very common in Philly that you'll find a juror who has a police officer in the family, but they also have a family member who's doing hard time and another yeah. who's been the victim of a terrible crime. You know, that's the reality. That's the three-dimensional reality we live in. So running for office when you've been informed in that kind of way for a very long time, and unlike someone who runs for mayor or for senator, running it for an office that has pretty narrow walls to it. You know, our office is criminal justice. Yes, it affects many other things. But when you know something for 30 years, as opposed to being some kind of a generalist, you're in, you're in a pretty good spot. Is it different? Yes. Is it scary? Yes. Was it exhilarating? Absolutely. Do I think I learned things that I never would have learned about the city and about its people by running? Yes. Um, you know, and I've now run twice. And I have to say, I think the greatest lesson that came out of all of this is we do not understand how much power we truly have. One of the things that the dominant political parties do is spend most of their time telling you, you can't run. Well, yes, you can. Yes, you can. They're mostly good at telling you, you can't. They're mostly good at claiming they got the keys to the kingdom. No, they don't. You actually have the keys to the kingdom. You just have to be creative and you have to use your activist sensibilities. You got to use your ability to communicate with others to get there. But, you know, more and more, it is my hope, we'll, we'll see people who never thought about running for office run, because those are, in many cases, the ones we need. Speaking of things uh, that conventional wisdom tell us, uh, some have been saying more recently that uh, the uh, crime increase during the pandemic and other trends that they've seen uh, would make it hard for someone like you to get reelected. Um, what do you think uh, made the difference in um, Philadelphia in your uh, primary election when you ran for re-election, given the increase in crime across the country and increase in some people's fear and some of the sensationalization of, of the, 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 the uh, trends by the media, um, what, what carried you through to win your Democratic primary again? Well, um, you know, I, I don't know that this is about me. I don't think it's ever been about me. It really is about the fact that there is a grassroots movement for criminal justice reform. I would, I would time it at about 11 years now. Mm -hmm. they, know what they, they know what they want. You know, there's nothing special about me. I'm a pretty ordinary person in a lot of ways, but um, they know what they want and they're ready to pick the technicians that they want. There was a st steady drumbeat coming from the institutions, political institutions that, that were not inclined to support me, even though I was the incumbent, mm -hmm. uh, coming from media that bought into a particular narrative, which is essentially what bleeds leads, a very unscientific and emotional, visceral narrative mm -hmm. about crime that demonizes anyone who is charged with it and never looks at the broader implications of it. Uh, you know, we were up against all of that. And yet Philadelphians came in at literally more than two to one. 
yeah. for, for re-election. There were tons of money coming in from all kinds of national PACs to try to beat us down. And yet we had this stunning, overwhelming win that did wasn't just a victory. The other thing that is often overlooked is it turned out a lot of votes who don't turn out. And this is the second consecutive cycle where criminal justice reform was on the ballot in the DA's race and more and more and more unlikely reluctant voters turned out. Separate topic, but there's a, a damn good argument that if you'd like to save democracy, put criminal justice reform on the ballot and you're gonna get all the people who Republicans are trying to disenfranchise to yeah. come out and vote and then we'll be able to push back these nonsense efforts to cut off their votes. But what I think did it simply put is the people know what they want. And they know that the fix has been in for a long time. Fix has been in from the institutions, but it's also been in from the media. And they weren't buying it. You know, they knew the truth and we told them the truth, which is that we had a, a decrease in crime all over the country. True. That there was actually a decrease in violent crime all over the country. True. But there was also a terrible increase in gun violence yeah. all over the country. Also true that that was the truth. And if it was existing with the same prevalence in places where you had traditional prosecutors, which it was, as yeah. it was in places where you had progressive prosecutors, then this is just dirty opportunistic politics. This isn't the truth. So, you know, when you talk in those terms and you understand that this grassroots movement believes in prevention, they believe in public health, they believe in not going back to the kind of uh, vicious policing, brutal and racist policing that we have seen and not going back to mass incarceration, then you have your answer. And Philly had its answer. We'll talk about um, let's get into the book a little bit more because it, uh, it's more about what you did prior to becoming district attorney. Let's talk about some of the stories you tell. One of them is in chapter seven, uh, the chapter on police integrity. You write about how you represented a woman named Khadijah Costley White, who is now a tenured professor of communications at a time when she had everything to lose in an unjust system. Tell us her story and what that story means to you and why you wanted to tell it in the book. Well, Khadija is one of my one of my many favorite clients of all time. Khadija uh, was a it was a young African American woman getting her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, a place you know, yes. at the Annenberg, Annenberg Center for Communications. Um, and I first met her in connection with an Occupy protest. She had been involved in protests that were going on outside of City Hall, which is a central place in Philly, the locus of power, really. And the city decided they would, quote, clean up, unquote, around City Hall. So she got swept up in that. And she was one of many trials, uh, excuse me, one of many clients I represented in a trial. She was found not guilty at that point. Later on, and she, by the way, when she's doing that, she's working on this PhD thesis and doing great. A little bit later, there came a moment to clean up something else. This time they were going to clean up all the homeless people. Why? Because the Pope was coming to visit in Philadelphia, the most, uh, the most conscious Pope in a, in a very, very long time on the issue of poverty we've ever had. But the city's solution was don't let them see homeless people. Go mm -hmm. figure. Anyway, so she was in a particular moment when she was about to win a big prize the next day from the University of Pennsylvania. I think it was the African-American uh, student of the year, graduate student of the year. She had relatives coming in from out of town. And she had bought some food at the Reading Terminal Market, which, of course, is a famous farmer's market in Philadelphia. She's pushing her bike, getting ready to ride home. And she sees that a lot of her activist colleagues, a lot of her activist friends have lined up to go into a city meeting to explain how upset they are with the idea that you're going to push homeless people away, that you're not going to let them be fed when the Pope is in town. So she goes over basically to greet them and to talk to the police who are pretty forbidding presence and keeping people out of this building at the time. And unfortunately, very shortly thereafter, her bicycle becomes entangled with police officer's bike. She is yanked over the police line by her hand, breaking her finger, charged with a variety of crimes. This is now the second time that this woman has been charged with these crimes. She ends up with a uh, broken finger on her hand, stuck in jail all night, she is not released until after the award has been given out to an audience that is cheering when they find out that she is in custody under mm. these circumstances. I did the trial. She was not convicted. We then did a civil lawsuit for her because there was video of the incident. And to me, you know, to me, it's such a fascinating story of what you might call a perfect person. None of us are perfect. Yeah. But here's someone whose achievements were truly extraordinary. This was a church going woman who had nothing but a giant heart to help the entire world. And even she, 
ended up with her entire future on the chopping block under these circumstances. Uh, you know, one of the great ironies of it, and I mentioned it in the book, is that the turning point in her trial was that a very large police officer with a great big white shirt, which meant he was a senior officer, claimed that Khadija had pushed him and knocked him backward. Well, the thing about it was Khadija's dark hand never shows up on this big expanse of white shirt mm. in that video. You know, it might be one of the few times that having dark skin actually helped you in a trial in a mm. criminal courtroom or a civil courtroom, but it never showed up. And it was a situation in which juries who might not even have wanted to believe this remarkable person had to believe their eyes, whether they wanted to or not. She was victorious in her criminal trial and in her civil case. But I, to, to me, she is such an example of how it really doesn't matter how good you are. It really doesn't. When the system wants to get you, it's going to try real hard. And you better hope that um, either you have a prosecutor who's not going to prosecute that in the first place, or you better hope that you have a jury who, who are going to get it right. Well, uh, of course, she was a, about the most perfect client you could have had. But obviously, uh, during your time, uh, a lot of your clients don't come to you perfect. <laughs> they come to you complicated, messy. They might have uh, done some of what they're accused of. Um, they might have made some mistakes in their lives. How do you uh, find a way to understand that there's a need for some level of accountability, but also uh, understand there's a, a need for mercy and grace as well? You know, your, your, your point goes right to the heart of it, which is if you believe in individual justice, then you believe in justice for someone who is guilty. You want to make sure that whatever the accountability is, whether it's a conviction or it's a diversion, maybe you want to make sure accountability is appropriate. So it is just as important that we make sure that a sentence that really should have been probation isn't 20 years, you know, yeah. even if you're guilty, that we make sure that the process itself is fair and the facts are are not hidden. That is what's so challenging and so exciting in many ways about trying to do individual justice is there is no one size fits all. This is the terrible flaw in mandatory sentencing. This is the terrible flaw in a lot of sentencing guidelines that try to tie the hands of judges and limit what it is that they can do. Uh, you know, you really have to look at all the wrinkles and all the nuances to figure out what is the right thing to do. And you're not always going to get it right either. But simply trying to be fair is something that traditional prosecutors have not done. That's a phrase, by the way, I hear all the time when I walk around the streets in Philadelphia. I hear people say, oh, yeah, you're the guy, you're, you're trying to be fair. Well, yeah. the reason they're saying that is they're so used to chief prosecutors not even trying. They're so used to it being political, brutal, racist, simplistic. They're so used to that. Yeah. That, you know, people who even see the effort appreciate it. Well, let's talk a little bit about your list of lessons. You have a list of eight lessons, uh, how outsiders can take back power so that government really works for the community. Um, talk about those lessons and, and some of the highlights from those lessons. Well, I'm not looking at the list, but let me, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few. By the way, one of the hilarious things about this is the book was actually published about a month before re-election, uh, and, and apparently the mainstream Democratic Party didn't pick it up and read it, because if they had, perhaps they would have had a roadmap for what we were about to do. <laughs> you but, gave them the playbook. <laughs> it was know, right the playbook. They, didn't, they didn't want to read it. What can I say? <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I'll just give you an example. The, I mean, think of the advantage in your knowing exactly what the mainstream party is going to do on election day, because you can go back and look at the results from two or three or four prior cycles, you can talk to people, but they don't know your playbook. They haven't seen your moves or how are you going to, you're going to do it. Um, you know, imagine not talking like a politician instead of saying two things at the same time and looking around furtively to see who's in the room. Instead of doing that, what if you just say what you think? What yeah. if you just said, I don't like the death penalty. I think yeah. we need to get some people out of jail. Well, I mean, the fact is that most people don't like politicians and they don't like politicians, I'm not saying every politician, but they don't like them because they think that they're a bunch of chameleons, they're putty, they'll say anything, and they'll probably say, you know, opposite things in different rooms or opposite things at the same time. What about just telling them what you think? And if it matches the times and it matches the voters, they're going to go there and they're going to give it to you. And then, of course, just one more little one is <clears throat> your creative imaginative people do it differently. Do something differently. Trust me, the mainstream party won't. The reality yeah. is, to a large extent, they don't make winners. They haven't made winners for a long time. They just pick people who they think are going to win, and then they put the seal of approval on them because that's the, how they can maintain this illusion 
of power. And it is an illusion of power. If you think you cannot run or someone you know who you believe should be a prosecu chief prosecutor somewhere cannot run, well, no offense, but you're wrong. You can. That power really is there. It's just a question of being different and being willing to use the element of surprise, your connections with activists and others to get there. Well, let's talk about what you would write uh, if you were to uh, kind of uh, continue your book beyond your swearing in. Um, what kinds of lessons have you learned since you've gotten elected and since you've run for re-election? Uh, what, what else would you like to share if, if you were to write an addendum to this book? So I think if I were to write an addendum at this point, and it's actually a discussion I, I've had with uh, Chris Jackson, who was the, you know, the wonderful editor of this book, uh, a guy I really have come to admire and like very, very much, a guy who's um, edited some much more important books like Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy and things like that. I think, what I, would, I think what I would write at this point would go to the reality that you cannot separate criminal justice reform from saving our democracy right now. This is either the criminal justice issue of our time, or it contains within it so many pieces of the most important civil rights issues of our time that it is exciting to people who are not regular voters. It's exciting to people who have never voted before. And what a lot of them are seeing around the country is as they're able to elect Kim Fox in Chicago or Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore, as they're able to elect Monique Worrell in Florida, as they're able to elect all these progressive prosecutors all over the country, so many now that 10% of the United States has elected a progressive prosecutor and reelected them all over the country. As they see that, they are excited, they are emboldened. They realize that something that seemed unchangeable in their society can change. And what happens, instead of having a 9% voter turnout, which is what was happening in DA's races before we ran, well, you now have 21%. That is obviously a very low turnout, but it's an off cycle turnout. Yeah. If you can put criminal justice reform on the ballot all over the country, because this is a real grassroots movement, because it does not, it excites black and brown people for obvious reasons, but it also excites young people. It excites people of goodwill of all types for obvious reasons. This is what the crushing weight of mass incarceration has done to us the deprivation and, and turning of all our resources away from prevention. This is what it's done to us. If you put this on the ballot in the form of candidates who are vocal and supportive of these issues, then you will see democratic participation like we have not seen yet. And you will see the antidote to minority rule, by which I mean the attempted rule of the United States by Mitch McConnell, mm -hmm. uh, too, too many white supremacists and a whole bunch of people who don't actually have the voters, but they seem to have a stranglehold on power almost no, no matter what we do. So I do think, especially as we head into the midterms, this is a key point. We have to put criminal justice reform on the ballot because it is what will bring out all sorts of uh, voters and reluctant voters. And you can't run scared. Um, I think sometimes uh, people believe that uh, if you run on the defensive, if you're worried about people accusing you of uh, being for defund or all these other things, um, you have to tell people what you're for and, and make an affirmative case for why you should get elected and, and be confident in that case and not run from it. Um, and I believe you've done that successfully and that's why you've gotten elected uh, the first time and already won a, a very uh, lopsided primary victory uh, for your upcoming uh, general election uh, campaign coming up soon. Um, finally, before we get to the audience Q&A, let's talk music for a second. Uh, you've got a For the People playlist. Tell us about some of the songs you chose and why you chose them. Well, okay. So first of all, I'm a lot older than you. I'm 60, but you know, <laughs> me and my little battery driven transistor radio used to hide out in the basement and play all kinds of music. My parents probably didn't want me to be playing from like age 10 on. So I got a few years with the radio uh, and it is, you know, it's a, it's just songs that come to mind from all different parts of my life. You've got NWA in there. You have, uh, you know, Elton John singing Philadelphia Freedom in there. You have a song from the Jungle Book by Ka the snake, uh, <laughs> in, in which he's trying to convince you to just trust him alone. And you know what happens next. Uh, and we also, as it happens, we have a song by uh, Common and John Legend, you might have heard of it, called Glory, because it, it seemed to fit that moment when that was a chapter in which we're talking about young attorneys from all over the country who we brought in 
being sworn in. Uh, and they stand up just as the song talks about. So it's all of those things. You know, I, I'm a huge music fan and I've always believed that art has a capacity to unite people. There's something about the ambiguity that is in those lyrics that brings people together in a human way, even when they might want to fight about politics or policy or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, for me, it just seemed like no fun at all unless we had a playlist. And so in fact, we have a playlist. Well, I'm grateful to be a part of it. And uh, as you might remember, when I uh, got on the stage with Common, uh, when we won the Academy Award for that song, uh, we talked about criminal justice reform. I talked about us being the most incarcerated country in the world. Um, I, I said, we need to do something about that. And, uh, and uh, that far too many black and brown people are uh, living under state supervision right now. And we need to change that. And since then I've been working uh, on that issue with my organization, Free America. And, and one of the major things we've done is gotten involved in, uh, in races like yours all around the country. And we've been part of a lot of those names that you mentioned of, of people who are running uh, district attorney's offices in major cities around the country, major population centers around the country. So uh, we're happy to be part of this fight with you. And I'm so grateful I got to speak with you about this fantastic book um, we've got some questions from the audience. I have to run. I'm going to go uh, do the red carpet for the Space Jam premiere awesome. uh, with LeBron James and a few others. Um, I have a couple of songs in the soundtrack. So I'm going to leave it to Avi to uh, go through the uh, audience Q&A with you. But thank you so much for inviting me to join you in this uh, conversation. I'm so happy uh, that this book is out in the world and uh, so proud to be a supporter of yours. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, John. Always appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, John. Take care. So we actually have quite a few questions from the audience members, very engaged audience. Um, so let's just go and right to it. Um, the first question is from Maddie Johnson. Her question is, what milestones would you like to see when it comes to wrongful convictions and what does the path to get there look like to you? Wonderful question. So, uh, you know, we've been on a, a pretty heavy quest to deal with wrongful convictions as they have in Chicago as well. Um, we have at this point in the space of three and a half years exonerated 21 people on 22 cases. Just because of the nature of the work, they're, they're nearly all homicide cases. They're nearly all people who either got a death penalty sentence or they received a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. It will probably not surprise you that um, every single one of them, but one, it's a person of color. Uh, every single one of them, but two is black because that is part of the texture of our system and how it works. Sadly, it's, there are two things that we have to do with it. You know, we have to look and try to do individual justice to situations where there may be an innocent person in jail or where there may have been a conviction ob obtained by lying, cheating, and stealing. Because make no mistake, prosecutors are just as good at doing things that have no integrity as police officers have been. This is not a problem just with policing. It's a, a problem with prosecution as well. The milestones I would like to see, I would like to see this type of a unit all over the country. I would like to see them funded. I would like to see them considered normal within criminal justice as opposed to unusual and exceptional. Uh, what we are seeing as we go through these cases is we see that there are certain detectives who just kept taking confessions from people whose innocence is scientifically proven by DNA. Well, how does that happen? How is it that someone who never saw a crime scene, who never participated in a crime, who knows none of the details, is doing a confession that contains all the details the detective knew? Doesn't that tell you what you need to know about the urgency of our doing this. So I would like to see a national phenomenon of these uh, units, and I would like to see them do the good work that we can do before more innocent people die in a jail cell. Definitely. And I do feel like one of those big milestones is the conversation that is around these topics. Um, and this is a perfect leeway to the next conversation. Uh, the next question, which says, with the Black Lives Matter protests last summer, People who never gave thought to our justice system began to at least awaken to what, what, sorry, began to at least awaken to people who are most affected by this unjust system. How do we keep the momentum going? Another great question. Well, you know, there, 
there's really nothing that happened during the Black Lives Matter movement that was unknown to Black people mm -hmm. and to Black and Brown people. What happened to George Floyd and was captured on video is a truly compelling, agonizing piece of video that's hard. It's just hard to even watch. But it was no surprise. It was a surprise to people who did not grow up in an urban environment, to people who are affluent, often to people who are white because it is not what they have known to be the case. And it was so undeniable. Uh, so how do we keep up the momentum? Well, you know, I, I, I will say this, and it's really not self-serving because my being reelected is a done deal. We do have seven Democrats for every Republican in Philly. But one of the ways that you do it is you make sure that you get progressive prosecutors elected in your jurisdiction. You make sure that you don't just hold the electable prosecutors accountable, that you hold your mayors accountable because they're going to appoint your police commissioner. You make sure that you hold your people in the House of Representatives accountable, and you make sure you hold your judges accountable because judges are electable in most places. In many places, they come up every six years or 10 years for confirmation that they should come back. And let's be honest, most people just vote for them to vote for them. They don't know a thing about who's running for judge and they know even less about people who've been on the bench. Get the information. If you know how to get the information, get it. Put out the information. If you know how to put it out, put it out. Digest the information, organize around the information and make sure the people who are, on, are in a position to make such important decisions are going to hear you and they're gonna do what you want, which is to build a system that is less structurally racist, that is less committed to crushing poor people and that is more committed to equal justice and to achieving it through prevention rather than retribution. Awesome. Um, our next question is from an anonymous attendee. They ask, did writing the book affect how you discuss policy or filter into your job in any way? Yes, it absolutely did. Uh, you know, I have not written a book before. My father was an author, and so I grew up in the home of an author, but I've not written a book before. And I can tell you, that in many ways my job changed. Yes, as a trial lawyer and a busy trial lawyer, I was a professional communicator, but I was a professional communicator within a very, very narrow range talking about discrete facts. When you become an elected official or you run for office, you are speaking in broader terms. And there is something about sitting around for hours at a time and really focusing on what, on your word choice, which words do you wanna use? Which ones do you not wanna use? the stories, the way you can explain things so that they are accessible. Uh, you know, Jesus spoke in parables for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's really easy for human beings to relate to a story and to attach to that story and to understand the concept behind it. And the discipline of trying to write, even as an amateur, the discipline of trying to write that put me in a position where that word choice was accessible. That story I'd thought about was accessible. So it became very, very helpful in interviews. It became helpful at press conferences. It became helpful at community meetings or just talking to somebody at a bus stop. Uh, and I'm very glad I did it for that reason, among others. And I do feel like, especially with this type of narrative, it's important to put personal anecdotes and personal cases because a lot of times people just disengage when they just see statistics or just numbers. And so very important in that part. Um, we have another question. Uh, this is actually about the PBS series. Um, they're asking, the PBS series about you was so compelling. How did it come about? So for those of you who have not seen it, uh, the name of the series is Philly DA. It came about because a couple of very, very talented filmmakers in Philadelphia, and then a third, Ted Passan, Yoni Brooke, who'd worked with each other before, and a young woman named Nicole Salazar got together and they had this idea, which is that rather than do a documentary or a docu-series full of talking heads who are speaking about things that happened in the past, they would like to cover developments as, as crusaders, put it that way, or people who have come in with the idea that they're going to bring change, actually try to carry it out. So, you know, they came and asked me after we were in office, I was, I was feeling like I was uh, lucky because we had won a uh, political race that nobody thought we could win. But I also thought that our successes and our failures could be a lesson to others who wanted to do the same thing. And the most important lesson would be that we're just ordinary people. 
And we're, we're just trying like any ordinary people to try to do the right thing within a system that makes that hard, right? So we gave them access, not to everything. There were a lot of things they were not allowed to see for ethical reasons, for legal reasons, just because it was unseemly. Uh, but we gave them access. I had no editorial control other than advising whether I thought something they were doing was illegal. Obviously, there was no you know, financial benefit for any of the participants. And one of the beauties of it was they, it wasn't just about me. It was really about a whole team of people who were true idealists, who were mission-driven, trying to change things. And it gave equal and fair time to people who disagreed with us, whose opinions needed to be heard as well. I think that has been part of its amazing success. And it has been amazingly successful, critically, in terms of its viewership. It attracted a ton of young people unaccustomed to PBS, to PBS, which is, I think is very exciting. And has now been picked up by the BBC. Uh, you know, expect to see it around for a while. Um, so, you know, that that's it. A lot of people thought we were nuts to say that we would do it. Maybe they were right, but I'm, I'm glad it happened because I do think it should be encouraging to anyone around the country who wants to change things to see it and say, well, if they can do it, we ought to be able to do it too, because that really is the lesson that, yes, you can do it. Especially now that uh, political races are becoming more and more competitive and the underdogs seem to be winning more and more as each cycle uh, passes. So very important story. Um, so now more to local news to New York City. Uh, Maggie asks, how do you understand the decision to elect Eric Adams in New York City in terms of what the people want and need? Well, um, as much as I would like to answer that question, I'm not sure it's smart for me to answer that question. An election has occurred, someone has been elected, and I have a variety of connections and relationships with prosecutors uh, in the New York area, including the prosecutor who's done some, some pretty interesting things. Um, so I'm gonna leave it to the New Yorkers to figure that one out for right now. I'm just gonna say it, it is my sincere hope that what we're gonna see in leadership in New York is a commitment to criminal justice reform because it's very much needed. Uh, it is my sincere hope that we're not gonna go back to the gift that Rudy Giuliani just mm -hmm. keeps giving, you know, yeah. at least when he had his law license, <laughs> which, which, would, which was um, illegal, I repeat illegal, stop and frisk, and the uh, terrible mistreatment of communities that were supposed to be served, not abused, which has led to a situation in which in Philadelphia and New York and almost everywhere else, it, it is increasingly difficult to get anyone to be a witness, even to a violent crime, because there is such a, such a rift, such a division between police as a result of those policies and, uh, and people's willingness to participate in the system. So I'm hopeful for good things, but I'm going to leave the expert analysis to someone else. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, Bill Anderson asks, what are your thoughts on juvenile detention that seems to ruin lives? Juvenile has been a very serious priority in our administration. A lot of progressive uh, prosecutors are of the- Sorry, Larry, you cut off at the beginning. Can you start again, please? Sorry. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yes. All right, that was probably Vladimir Putin messing with our connection. I just want you to know. Uh, so what, what, do, what do I think about it? I think we have to be very, very careful when we involve juveniles in the criminal justice system. There's a lot of evidence that even involving them in the system, I think that we have to be even more careful when we detain and lock up uh, juveniles, whether it is in a detention facility or a school or a juvenile jail, because they're often the same thing. And over time, many of them have turned out to be snake pits that are very abusive, where the education is inadequate. They're also incredibly expensive. In Pennsylvania, it's about $200,000 per year to put a juvenile into placement, almost four times as expensive as the average adult inmate. So we got to be real careful when we do that. I can tell you during our administration, we've been able to knock down the number of Philadelphia juveniles who are in detention, almost 80%. And we see no evidence among those juveniles that trying to deal with their issues closer to home, trying to keep them in their homes and communities is a problem. It seems to us that it is an advantage so far. Uh, longer story, 
but uh, you know that is the, that's the essence. In the minds of a lot of traditional prosecutors, the ultimate place to be as a prosecutor was in juvenile because, oh my goodness, you could try to get the death penalty. Oh my goodness. You could handle terribly serious crimes and get people life sentences. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it's important work, but in the mind of a lot of progressive prosecutors, being in the juvenile justice system and trying to make constructive decisions that are rehabilitative with young people so their lives are turned away from crime as opposed to being turned toward it is arguably more important in terms of being able to make a difference in the system. No, maybe not more important for punishment if that's all that motivates you, but if what motivates you is you actually want society to improve, uh, then for a lot of us, juvenile justice is the place to be and arguably the most important unit within a prosecutor's office. Absolutely, especially since juveniles, they are experiencing the most transformative years of their lives. That's gonna shape how they become as adults in the future. Um, but Larry, thank you so much. Very, very insightful conversation uh, to our audience members. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, but if you guys would like to make a purchase of Larry's debut book, actually, for the people, you could do so with the link um, on the chat. If not, you could definitely go on strandbooks.com and find the book there. Uh, Larry, any final words before we conclude? Um, well, okay, let me just say this. We've seen a very, very interesting experiment which I think goes to the core of the issue with criminal justice, which is that we've had to resentence an awful lot of juvenile lifers, meaning people who were involved in a homicide as juveniles and they got life sentences or in some cases, death sentences. And the amazing thing is when they're released 30, 40, 50 years later, they don't commit crimes. The rate of their committing crimes is almost zero. And we are now speaking of a group who were deemed to be such menaces to society, they had to die in jail, whether by execution or by expiration of their lives. If that doesn't tell you what we need to know, which is that people can fundamentally change, which is why criminal justice has to change, but it also tells us what we need to know about politics, which is that people can fundamentally change and something that's been real bad for a really long time can be changed. And that is our cities can change, our government can change, and we can do things in a different way. To me, that's the core. It's all the same story, which is people have a marvelous capacity for change we have to realize it. And when we do, we'll all be doing a lot better. Amazing. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, with that, audience, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope you join us in future events here at The Strand. Um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.